All right. Okay, now we've got sound on the recording. Sukkot, the Lulav, and ancient rituals in modern life. As Jews, we live in a world that is both modern and ancient simultaneously. It is uh, an interesting and sometimes difficult line that we walk. We are one of the oldest world religions that is still practiced widely today. <clears throat> and yet we're also completely a modern religion in the world. <clears throat> We experience that every single day of our Jewish existence, and that affords us a special connection to history and a special connection to uh, the world of our ancestors. I begin this session with what might seem like an unusual question. Where does an apple come from? Where does an apple come from? It's not something that you think about very often, but this apple, you could say an apple comes from a tree, but where does the tree come from? You could say the ground, from water, from a seed, but where does the seed come from? Everything, everything comes from God. If it were not for God, there would be no apple seed if it were not for the seed, there would be no apple tree. There would be no water raining down from heaven. And there would be no apple. In Judaism, there is an idea of what we call nitzotzot. This is getting into Jewish mysticism a little bit and how it connects with our day-to-day -day lives. Nitzotzot literally means sparks. <clears throat> and the mystics believe that everything in the universe contains divine sparks of light. From the very beginning of creation, we uh, experienced a universe that was uh, built out of God's perfect light that was supposed to be the universe we live in. But we know that the universe is not perfect. We know that we are not yet in that perfect universe, that that perfect universe that God intended to create didn't happen right away, or else it didn't last. According to Jewish mysticism, that perfect vessel of God's light shattered, and the light got trapped in the world. So then our task is to use mitzvot, use God's commandments, to free these sparks from the world. When we free these sparks, these divine sparks contained in every living thing, perhaps contained in every, uh, even if it's not alive. <clears throat> if we free these sparks, they're able to return to the source to reassemble in sort of this perfect uh, vessel for God's light. Well, let's do a mitzvah. Saying a blessing is a mitzvah. This is good practice for Tu Bishvat, which is coming up, even though it's not this week's session. Uh, and by the way, check your email. Make sure that you do RSVP for our Tu Bishvat event at the temple, because uh, if you RSVP, then we can make sure that we'll have a uh, food tray ready for you. These, if you haven't seen the... Um, uh, the, the, the trays that are uh, made, check the links in the email. I'm trying to remember the name of her company now. Uh, I think it's like Delizia, uh, like Delicioso, Delicia, uh, but with a Z. <clears throat> they are really delicious, really choice. You don't want to miss out on it. Uh, so make sure you RSVP if you haven't already. Um, if, if you get the emails, it's very simple. Click the link that says RSVP now and fill out, I think it's like two or three questions on the form just so that we know who you are and how many people you're bringing. And uh, we'll make sure that you have uh, everything that you're supposed to have for our Tu B'Shvat Seder. The blessings that we say dur during Tu B'Shvat uh, start off like most blessings, Baruch Adonai. Every blessing starts off Baruch Adonai. 
But this uh, particular blessing for something that comes from a tree ends in bore peri ha eights. You can say it with me. Bore peri ha eights. Eights means tree. So let's say the blessing for the apple. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam bore peri ha eights. So now we've said the blessing over the apple. We were going to eat the apple anyway, but when we say the blessing, we've taken just an ordinary apple and transformed the act of eating the apple into an act of God, into a sacred act. We've transformed this ordinary apple into something special, something sacred. And in doing so, we are able to free the sparks of light within it. So I'm going to, here I've got my, I've got my napkin here just in case it's a little bit messy. I'm going to, usually you cut an apple into slices like this. I'm going to cut it sideways. And hopefully if I've done this right, you'll be able to actually see the sparks of light within the apple. I'm going to try one, one, one more time. Maybe you can see it even better. You can see that perfect spark inside the apple. By the way, that's a, that's a great activity to do with little kids. When they see the star inside the apple, they, it wows them every time. Have you ever seen that before? Some of, some of you who've taught young kids might know that. <clears throat> It's an, it's, it gives them a nice surprise at the end of the story. Uh, and of course, since I said the blessing, I better eat a piece of the apple. So this brings us to Sukkot, or rather this sets the, the stage for Sukkot. Sukkot is one of these activities that's connected with nature, that's connected with the spiritual world, that's connected with history, and that's connected with modern life all at the same time. So when does Sukkot happen? In the Jewish calendar, it's on the 15th of Tishrei, the 15th day of the month of Tishrei, which is the same month as some other major holidays that you might also know. It's the same day, or the same month as uh, Rosh Hashanah, the same day as Yom Kippur, that these are uh, our high holidays. Right after Yom Kippur ends, uh, you start building the sukkah. Uh, actually, I learned this year, the things you learn because of a pandemic, I learned this year that you are permitted to um, start building the sukkah up to 30 days in advance. That's the halakha. The tradition is that you usually start building it after Yom Kippur. This year, that was just not possible. But the first day of Sukkot is on the 15th day of Tishrei. Why? On the 15th day of the month, because the Hebrew months always follow the uh, lunar cycle, the 15th day of the month will always be a full moon. So if you're going to have a festival at the end of your harvest season and you want to finish all of your harvesting by the end of, of Sukkot, that's your deadline to get all of your harvesting in before the rainy season starts. You can't harvest after, you know, you don't want your grain to get wet. Any farmers in the group here? No? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want your grain to get wet because then it can get rotten and it can get moldy and it's just ruined. So Sukkot is your, it's your last chance to do all of your harvesting to get your grain ready for storage through the rainy season. <clears throat> if you're going to have a festival where you're going to be doing a lot of work and maybe working into the evening and into the night, well, then you're going to want to make sure that you have plenty of light which means a full moon. <clears throat> there are a lot of holidays that come with a full moon. 
Another one that's coming up is Tu Bishvat. Always happens on a full moon. <clears throat> Another one that's coming up a little bit later in a couple of months is Pesach. The first night of Passover is also a full moon. It's on the 15th of Nisan. We have so many holidays that start on the 15th of the month because there's a full moon overhead and it makes it a lot easier to party into the night well before electric lights were invented. <clears throat> now this, this, is, this is the part that I really like because I get to uh, break out my, my $5 collar twirls. Many of the rituals of Sukkot and many of the rituals of holidays across different religions <clears throat> may have begun as apotropaic rituals. This is not a word you need to have in your notes, but it's a fun word to know. An apotropaic ritual is a ritual which is intended to bring the favor of a deity and to affect the deity in such a way that uh, the deity will do good things for you. <clears throat> now we know that Judaism was not the first religion of the ancient Near East. We know that Jews came out of other religions. There's the famous story of Abraham smashing the idols of his father because he came from a family of idol worshipers, because everybody was idol worshipers. Now, idol worship is not just different from monotheism in that there are more gods, but the way those gods function is completely different. <clears throat> So what are some examples of apotropaic rituals? Well, we're, we're now uh, well into January. Some of your neighbors might still be waiting to take their Christmas trees down, but they might not know that the Christmas tree originally started as an apotropaic ritual. It was a pagan ritual for the the, the winter solstice, when the days are the shortest, the light is the least. And the idea was you would put candles or lights around an evergreen tree. Why an evergreen tree? Because it's a promise that the world will be green again. Winter, all of the plants uh, you know, die or go into hibernation. The, the leaves turn brown and fall out. But uh, evergreen trees, as their name suggests, stay green. So the pagans of Europe would decorate and put lights on an evergreen tree at the winter solstice to convince the gods to restore the summer. They believe that by doing this, it would ensure that the, the harshness and coldness uh, of winter would fade more quickly. That ritual was so widely practiced that it became adopted into Christianity. The, 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 the Christians couldn't get rid of this pagan ritual, but they could change the context of it and incorporate it into Christianity. Now, before we get high and mighty, a lot of things probably happened the exact same way with Judaism. Rituals like Sukkot, Passover, circumcision, these are rituals that probably predated the Torah. These are very ancient rituals that our ancestors performed before Judaism existed. So these rituals were probably like decorating the solstice tree, were probably so popular that when Judaism first started, the author or authors of the Torah thought, you know, there's no way that we can get rid of these practices entirely, but we can recontextualize them so that they're no longer, uh, um, pagan is not the right word, so they're no longer monotheistic or polytheistic rather, uh, rituals they're no longer apotropaic rituals, 
now they become Jewish rituals. So the festival of Sukkot, which is a harvest festival, may have started as a way of persuading the harvest gods to bring rain, to have a bountiful uh, completion to the harvest, and to give thanks. Passover, uh, you know, painting the, the, the doorways with blood or having an amulet on your doorpost was probably a ritual that predated Judaism and was so popular as a way of uh, protection that if you had this amulet or if you had this blood on the door, that your god or one of the many gods would protect you. That ritual eventually became adopted into Judaism and the context was changed. Now it became not about the protection of some deity, but it became about showing honor for a household of Adonai, of God. <clears throat> now, why do we live in the little sukkah? I mean, it's literally called Sukkot. It's called the Festival of Booths. That's a, a, a little bit of an awkward translation, but it's fair. It's a fair translation. Our sukkah is, is it's a lot better than tabernacle. Uh, you'll, you'll see that in a, often in Christian contexts. It's translated as the Feast of Tabernacles. I don't know what a tabernacle is. I've never seen one, but I know what a booth is. So the Festival of Booths, why do we have a booth? Well, uh, one reason is it may have just been simpler. If you're out working in the field late into the night, you might not be near your home. And if you want to get right to it first thing in the morning, because you're trying to finish up your harvest, you're trying to, you know, really, uh, if you've been procrastinating your harvest all year, this is the time to catch up. So if you sleep out in the field in an impermanent booth, you just build, you cover it with the, the skach that you're, that you're already harvesting, uh, you've, you've got everything in place that you can wake up in the morning and, and pick up right where you left off so that you can really finish your harvest. It may have just been a matter of convenience. Or the whole ritual of Sukkot may have been about the beginning of the rainy season and a fertility ritual. Again, this predates Judaism. Judaism is a very old religion, but it was not the first. I just knocked my apple onto the floor. Why would you have a fertility ritual based around rain in the ancient Near Eastern understanding of the cosmos, of the universe? They considered uh, rain to be a symbol of fertility, which makes sense. The rain comes down and things grow. Uh, the gods of the sky were always male. Gods of the earth were always female. So the male god rains down or sends down rain, which fertilizes the female god and, and plants grow up. If you look at uh, ancient Near Eastern gods and goddesses, Baal, the god of the sky, was a male god. Uh, Asherah or Asheret was uh, usually depicted as a tree. That's an earth god. And she was a female, a goddess, I should say. So this ritual of Sukkot may have been connected with fertility before it was connected with Judaism. Take a look at the Lulav and Etrog. How did we end up with the Lulav and the Etrog? This is a really strange ritual, isn't it? It's not something that you would just come up with off the top of your head. This is really a bizarre one. However, if, you th if it was originally meant to be an apotropaic ritual and a fertility ritual, then all of a sudden the context of this image changes. If this is a symbol of fertility, well, this is, this is a test of, of how creative and, and, and or how sophomoric your mind might be. If you look at the, the shape of the lulav and etrog, 
how it might be connected with fertility. I will leave it at that. The specific species that are used in the Ruma may have at some point in the pre-Jewish history have had, um, uh, may have been believed to have particular properties, particular magical properties. And so we ended up with these four species because possibly, and this is, this is only, this is only a theory. There's, there's no proof of this. We don't have, um, you know, pictures of, of, uh, you know, lulavs. We don't have a fossilized lulav. We don't know uh, for certain that it predated Judaism, although we do know that it very quickly became a distinctive Jewish ritual. If you look at uh, ancient Jewish coins, the two symbols that you found, the two Jewish symbols, it was not the Star of David. That came hundreds of years later. The Star of David was not known to Israelites in the time of David, as far as we know came hundreds of years after David lived. But during those early uh, uh, Judean years, when we find symbols of Judaism, there are two symbols that we find. We find the menorah. I think the connection is obvious there. The menorah in the temple symbolizing the week, the holy week. And the other symbol we find is the lulav. You can find ancient coins that are that are thousands of years old from Judea that have a picture of a lulav on there. Um, <clears throat> but where did this come from? It may have been an older tradition. Regardless of where it came from, we have adapted this to uh, Jewish understanding. And not only that, but we've continued to uh, advance our sophistication of how we understand the lulav and etrog over the years. We have four species in the lulav and etrog. One, of course, is the etrog, the citron, and the other three make up what we collectively call the lulav, the palm, which is uh, the, the actual piece of the lulav, the actual, the, the handle part that holds everything together, that's made out of palm, as well as the long central spine that's all made out of palm leaf and i know a couple people are, are joining us from from tampa uh you can go in in i don't know if they have it here uh i've i've asked around it doesn't seem to be a custom although you could do it because you have plenty of palm trees here uh we used to go to to ebor city which is kind of the the uh you know funky off-color uh, neighborhood or like theaters and clubs and things and you would always see people on the street there uh, selling little creations that they folded out of palm leaves <clears throat> it's like origami so you take a palm leaf and you can fold it into this handle for the lulav we have the the four species of the lulav the first being the lulav, uh, which is palm. You've got myrtle, hadas, and willow, arava. Where did these symbols come from? We don't know. What do they mean to us today? That's where our work begins as Jews. There are two teachings that are, uh, I think, the most widespread, and at least I find the most inspiring. These are teachings that have come about years and years after. There's no verse in the Bible that says, here's what the lulav symbolizes. But because there is an empty space, what do we do as Jews? We fill it with meaning. We take what is something that is ordinary and we make it into something extraordinary. We make it into something sacred and meaningful. So these four species could be the spine, the eyes, the mouth, and the heart. The spine being the lulav, the long uh, uh, straight spine of the uh, uh, lulav. The <clears throat> hadas being uh, the eye because the leaf is shaped like an eye. 
The willow has a longer, thinner leaf shaped like a mouth or lips. And the etrog is sort of roundish, sort of bumpy, and it's sort of in the shape of a heart. And these are all the ways that we can praise God by having an upright spine. We even use that phrase, you know, to be upright means to, to do the right thing, to be a good person. To uh, have uh, faith in God in our hearts and to make sure that we direct our eyes towards holy things, that we spend our time reading Torah, we spend our time uh, learning from one another, and we don't spend our time just, you know, watching what, what uh, my, my dad used to call the idiot box. <laughs> and finally, our mouths, by praising God and by carefully guarding what we say, that we're not saying frivolous things and we're not saying harmful things, we're not spreading rumors, we're not spreading gossip, that we are measuring our words carefully, and that in itself is a holy act. A second interpretation of the lulav and etrog. At some point we noticed that these four species had unique characteristics relating to their aroma, and their taste. <clears throat> the palm is edible. You ever heard of heart of palm? You can get that sometimes like in a salad. So the palm is edible. You can eat it. Uh, the other reason that a palm is edible is because you have date palms and you can eat the date. Uh, hadas, willow, uh, myrtle rather, has a very pleasant aroma, but you can't eat it. The willow, has no aroma, and you can't eat it. Don't, don't, don't go eat a willow tree. If you only learn one thing from this lesson, don't eat a willow tree. Uh, and the citron has a beautiful aroma. That's like one of my favorite things about uh, um, Sukkot is actually smelling the etrog. Uh, it just, that's how I know that it's really Sukkot. And you can also eat it. Uh, you, people make jams and jellies. People make, uh, you know, different desserts. They use it as a seasoning. Uh, there are some customs where you actually eat an etrog uh, whole or a part of an etrog whole um, that, uh, that are still done in some communities as, as uh, sort of a, a way of, of having good luck. But what is the symbolism of this difference? <clears throat> If aroma is like deeds, because when you do a good deed, it spreads out. And if taste is like knowledge, because it's internal, there are four types of Jews in the world, symbolized by these four symbols. The palm, which has good deeds, I'm sorry, which has knowledge, it has a taste, but no good deeds. This is somebody who studies and studies. They know every detail of Torah. They can tell you every story, every law, but they don't do a lot with their lives. And then there's the myrtle, the hadas, which has a beautiful aroma, but no, no, uh, no knowledge. This is somebody who's out there who is... Uh, you know, crying for, for, for uh, justice, who's working, who's, who's, you know, serving on the board of a nonprofit or 10 nonprofits, somebody who's out there always working to make the world a better place, but they have no study. They have no foundation of their Jewish life, and they have nothing to uh, uh, pass on to the next generation. They've got the values, but not the knowledge. Then <clears throat> there is the willow which is somebody who might be Jewish, but they have no interest in Judaism, no interest in learning Torah, and they don't really do a whole lot in terms of making the world a better place. They go through their life, they live their life, maybe they're happy, but they don't contribute to society. Uh, they don't volunteer, they don't serve on a board, they don't uh, do a lot of good deeds, they don't go out of their way 
to make sure that their legacy is one that the world is better because they were in it. And finally, you have the citron, which is uh, both has good deeds, aroma, and a good taste, knowledge. This is somebody who studies, who's dedicated, who's at Torah study every Saturday, <clears throat> who uh, maybe in this city goes to a couple different synagogues, and somebody who is also out there championing the poor and the disadvantaged, somebody who's working to make the world a better place, somebody who volunteers every free minute that they have. And the amazing thing about Sukkot is what do we do with these four species? What is the commandment to bring them together? There is no statement in the Lulav that says one is better than another. It's saying all of these are part of one body. All of these are part of one people. All of these pieces are important. Guess what? If you're Jewish, you matter to the Jewish people. And it doesn't matter if you, it doesn't make a difference if you're out there every single day fighting for a cause. And it doesn't make a difference if you're out there every single day uh, studying Torah. <clears throat> you still matter to the Jewish people. Of course, you should do those things. But you don't matter any less. That's why we bring those four together to form the lulav and the etrog. <clears throat> As we move forward through time, Sukkot changes because our lives change, just like all of the holidays change in their own ways. In today's world, we understand Sukkot as a reflection of impermanence. You build a sukkah, you live in it for a period of days, and then you take it down. And it's gone forever. Every home that we live in, chances are you're not going to live in one home for your entire life. Odds are everything that is, comes into your life will at one point leave. We don't like to think about that, but we know that it's true. And we know that it's a part of life. And the better we can come to accept that, the more we can appreciate those impermanent things while they're a part of our lives, rather than appreciating them only when they're gone. Somebody should write a song about that, and maybe something about taxis. <clears throat> we also think of oops, we also think of Sukkot as a symbol uh, not just of the harvest cycle, but we recognize that the harvest cycle is a cycle of life and death. The grain grows, it yields its fruit, or wheat, or you know, however you want to call it. Uh, it's cut down. And the cycle continues. It's replanted and it grows the next year, and it's a cycle. We experience the same thing in our own lives. This is reflected in the, um, the scroll that we read during Sukkot. Did you know there are five scrolls in Judaism? There are five scrolls, Chamesh uh, Megillot, and we read these five scrolls during five different holidays during the year. The most famous is the Megillah that we read on Purim, which is Megillat Esther. We read the scroll of Esther on Purim because it tells the story of Purim, so that makes sense. But we read all five of those scrolls during the calendar year, and the one that we read during Sukkot is called Kohelet. Uh, I think the, the Latin name is Ecclesiastes. If you're not familiar with it, you might be familiar with the, uh, I'll call it an old song, certainly not a new song. Uh, the birds, um, I want to say in the 60s, put this to music 
Turn, turn, turn. Do you know that song? For everything, turn, turn, turn. I see a couple people nodding and a couple people even smiling. It's a good song. It's a very nice song. And it, uh, they didn't write that song. They just took that right out of the page of the Bible, right out of the Tanakh. It's also in the Christian Bible. Uh, but they took that right out of the Tanakh. For everything, there is a season and a purpose uh, and a time for every purpose under heaven. That's right out of the book of Kohelet. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to gather stones, a time to cast away stones. Uh, this is also uh, because the way that it reflects this relationship between life and death, it's also a common uh, funeral reading. <clears throat> and finally, we also, in this age when we are so disconnected from nature, our ancestors couldn't help but be connected with the cycles of nature because that was how they lived. You had to farm. You had to uh, cut the grain. You had to uh, bring in the sheaves. You had to thresh the wheat to survive. We are so separated from that natural existence. Most of your kids, if you have kids or grandkids, you ask them, where does food come from? The smart ones might say, oh, well, an apple comes from a tree. But if you ask them, where does an apple come from? I bet a lot of them will say, from the store. We're so disconnected with the, the roots of our food, of our existence, of our uh, sustenance in the world. Sukkot is an opportunity to reconnect with nature. By sleeping and eating outside in a sukkah, it forces you to reconnect with nature. You can't turn up the heat if it gets a little bit chilly. You can't turn on the AC if it gets a little bit warm. Uh, that does come with an asterisk because even the rabbis uh, of the Talmud say if it's raining uh, and you're sitting out in your sukkah, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's a paraphrase. Only a very slight paraphrase. I think, I think a better translation might be a fool. <clears throat> so let's talk about the, the ritual objects of, uh, of Sukkot as they relate to Judaism. So, of course, you've got the sukkah itself. How do you describe a sukkah? What are the requirements of a sukkah? A sukkah must be a temporary structure. You can't have a permanent sukkah that you just go into and, and you know, it's there. You don't, nothing to set up. That would be, that would be too easy. No, it's got to be a temporary structure. That's the nature of the sukkah. <clears throat> it has to have a leafy roof. Uh, so it's not covered with branches. It's not covered with planks of wood. It's covered with, with something that's leafy. doesn't mean it's only leaves, but it's something leafy. Uh, when I was growing up in Colorado, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, corn grown in Colorado, and we would use uh, corn stalks. Around here, you've got palm leaves. That's probably what they used in ancient Israel. Although they may have used, you know, other things for skaf. That's another fun word. <laughs> if 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 you can't remember uh, apotropaic, at least remember how to say skaf. It's one of those fun Hebrew words. That's the 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 covering. So it has to have a leafy roof. The roof has to be more covered than not. That's like fifty one percent, right? More covered than not covered. Uh, you can tell that by looking at the ground underneath the sukkah and looking at the, the, you know, is it mostly shady or mostly sunny? If it's mostly sunny, then you need to add some more. It should be mostly shady, but not completely covered because you have to be able to see the stars. That's the halakha. <clears throat> when you go into your sukkah to shake the lulav. <clears throat> oh, and I didn't put the, the other halakha is what constant, what are you supposed to do with the sukkah? Once you have it, you're supposed to dwell in it. The rabbi said, well, what does it mean to dwell somewhere? Well, they said there are two particular activities 
that indicate where a person lives, <clears throat> where you're dwelling. We dwell in uh, places where we eat and sleep. And so when you go into the sukkah, those are the two things you're supposed to do during Sukkot. Eat in the sukkah and sleep in the sukkah. <clears throat> if you're able to do those things, then you're fulfilling the mitzvah. When you go into the sukkah, you can also shake, shake the lulav in the sukkah or out of the sukkah. When you shake the lulav, it's four easy steps. <clears throat> Uh, well, first you say the blessing, and then you start off facing east, and you shake it three times to the east, then to the south, the west, and you don't turn your body just by shaking it in a different direction. So this would be the, the west. Well, actually, I'm, I'm facing backwards, so that's the east, but you would shake it to the, the west would be behind you if you're facing east. Shake it to the north, which would be your left side. And because it shows every direction that God is in, there are seven directions where we can find God. So the four cardinal directions, we also find God up above us and down below us. God is everywhere. And we find God within us. So you finish shaking the lulav by bringing it in towards your heart. You don't have to shake it when you bring it in. When you bring it in, you don't shake it three times. Although there are different customs. Uh, this is just one way to shake the lulav. Every custom uh, shakes the lulav in six directions or seven. But the order, uh, whether or not you turn your body, whether or not you um, are reciting a particular song while you're doing it, these are all different customs that vary based on the community. This has become the most common and the most standard, but you go back 100 years, there were lots of different customs. There were people say you have to start facing west, or you, you uh, shake it instead of a clockwise in a counterclockwise, or you shake it once in each direction, but you go through three times. So you would go east, south, west, north, up, down east, south, west, north, up, down, and you would go through a third time, and then you would bring it in. So they're all different customs about uh, shaking the lulav, but this is probably the most common custom, so that's the one I'm teaching. It's important to be aware that there are other customs, even if that's not how you choose to do it. And I'm going to finish this session. Uh, if we were in person, we would all get up from our chairs and we would walk into the sanctuary and we would open up a Torah scroll. It's a little bit hard to do when we're online. Because this is maybe the perfect embodiment of ancient and modern, of uh, nature and innovation, of tradition and uh, passing along customs from our past. Every single Torah scroll is handwritten. And on top of that, every single Torah scroll is uh, an all natural document made out of all natural materials. In the ancient world, that wasn't so remarkable because everything, there was no such thing as artificial. There were no plastics. I guess you could say there's, you know, metal is artificial, but it still comes from the earth. But indeed, every single part of a Torah scroll is handmade. It begins with the parchment. A Torah scroll, if you don't know, is not printed on paper. How is paper made? It's, it's pulp from usually wood. It doesn't have to be. You can make paper from a lot of different things. And it's, um, you know, ground up into a pulp and then pressed together and dried, and that's how you get paper. Uh, different from papyrus, which is actually uh, more like a fabric. It's woven 
and then flattened. <clears throat> but paper is made from, from pulp. What is parchment made from? I don't mean the parchment that you use in your oven. The parchment you use in your oven, that's actually a kind of paper. But it used to be parchment. Uh, as it turns out, parchment is a little bit too expensive. And when you can make a paper that doesn't burn up very easily, then it's much, it's much better to sell uh, when you're baking. The parchment that you use in your oven is actually paper. It's not actually parchment. But originally it was. Your, your great grandmother probably used parchment when she was baking. And it is uh, skin. In the case of a Torah scroll, it's skin from a kosher animal, usually a sheep. But it could be a cow or a goat or something. So just like you might wear leather shoes, a uh, leather handbag, uh, just like we use other things that are made from natural materials. If you play violin, you might have a, a cat gut or guitar even. There are ways that we use uh, material, animal materials in a lot of different ways. So the parchment is actually a, uh, the skin of an animal. Now, a sheet of paper can be as large as the machine that makes it. Can, can uh, as large as the capacity of the machine that makes it. You can buy rolls of butcher paper that are yards and yards and hundreds of yards long. I don't know. I don't know what the longest sheet of paper is. Uh, we'll have to call Guinness about that. But parchment is a limited size, a sheet of parchment. And so the Torah is made of many sheets of parchment that are stitched together. And it's stitched together using sinew, usually from the same type of animal. Hand-stitched, and it's, uh, uh, each sheet is, after it's treated and, and um, flattened and uh, blanched, so that it bleached, um, blanched, I say, because it's not a chemical process, um, well, parts of it are a chemical process. <laughs> we can get into the details if you want. Give me a call after class. Um, once it's flattened and it's made white so that you can write on it, um, cleaned, they're stitched together. And then those pieces of parchment that are stitched together are then wrapped around a wooden dowel, a wooden dowel at each end. In fact, we call them the eight seam, the, the, the branches or the, the, the wooden pieces of the Torah. And so every part of the Torah is natural. That even includes the ink. The scribe, known as a sofer, S-O-F-E-R, if you're transliterating, usually makes his own ink. Actually, I can say his or her. There are a few. Um, Sofrot, female scribes, who write Torah scrolls. <clears throat> I think there are two in the world right now, but they exist. <laughs> so he or she probably makes the ink themselves from natural materials. Not only do they make their own ink, you know, we're talking berries and charcoal and things like that, not only do they make their own ink, they make their own pen that they dip in the ink. Usually made from uh, a reed or a feather. Most of them use uh, a, a feather because a, a reed um, is more durable. It will last longer, but it doesn't write as nicely comes out a little bit more blotchy. You can't make these beautiful fine lines. As you look at this Torah, can you see my cursor on the Torah scroll? It's probably very small for you. Not really? Well, if you can, I don't know if you're able to zoom in, if you're able to make me any bigger or specifically make the, the, the Torah over here a little bit bigger. 
you can see the shapes of the letters. There are thick lines and thin lines. And some of the letters, uh, this, by the way, that you're looking at is the Ten Commandments. And it's written in a very particular way where there are spaces in between some of the words. And if you open up any Torah scroll anywhere in the world from any period of time, you will see the exact same gaps between the words. You might even see the words in the same order in each column, depending on what custom it follows. Most Torah scrolls that are produced today, every single column is written the same way, but it was not always the case. You can find Torah scrolls with wider columns uh, that, were, that were written in different traditions. <clears throat> this, is, this is called a, a Vav Torah because every column starts with the letter Vav. Every column except for six. And what is the number six in Hebrew? It's the letter Vav. That's another teaching for another time. But you would find, no matter how wide or narrow the columns are, you can see where the column starts over here, over here, that's a column, and where it ends, I can't really point to the other side, <laughs> where it ends over on, the, over on the other side. Regardless of what the columns look like, the gaps in between words will always appear the same way with the same gaps in every single Torah scroll. If you look below where you see those gaps, you can see where there's a short line. There's a little line, it starts, and then there's nothing. There's just two words. That's when the Torah goes to a new line. That's a different type of a gap, a different type of a break, and that will be the same in every single Torah you read. Each letter will be the same, and in fact, the way that the letters are written, the uh, handwriting, so to speak, is very specific as well. And uh, if you can't see my cursor, you certainly cannot see, but maybe look at a picture of Torah scroll um, after class. You can see some of the letters have what are called crowns or tagin. So if you find a shin, you'll see three little lines on top of his head. <laughs> Looks like that. Imagine that I'm the letter shin. You see a crown on top of uh, those letters. Every single letter shin will have that crown. There are some examples of Torah scrolls in which those crowns can be uh, elaborate and decorative, um, or they can be very simple like you see here. You also might notice that there are some letters because it's handwritten and the columns are square. Some letters have to be stretched out. If you look just above where it says inside, over, over here, you see where it says inside, and look straight up from there, you see a dalad that's stretched way out to make sure that that line is square. That's something that a typewriter cannot do. That's something that a uh, word processor cannot do. That's something that a printing press cannot do. Only a handwritten uh, uh, scribe can uh, stretch or compress letters as needed. Okay, some, some computers can do that too. <laughs> computers are almost catching up with us. There's a very interesting uh, uh, project, an artist, I don't know, maybe five years ago or something like that, uh, built a robot that wrote a Torah in the traditional manner, except there was a robot moving the pen, but everything else about it was 100% traditional. <clears throat> because the Torah has been written 
in exactly this way, with exactly this precision, for thousands of years. We have examples of Torah scrolls, and you can see if you ever go to if you ever go to Israel, uh, you go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. You look at the you go to the Shrine of the Book, and you look at the Isaiah scroll, which is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls that's uh, over two thousand years old, and you see the same letters. If you know your Hebrew, you can read it even though it was written 2,000 years ago. Have you ever tried to do that with like an old English? Doesn't work. You can't do that with English. You can't do that with most languages. You can't do that with Chinese. But with Hebrew, because the written tradition has been so, uh, so ju um, judiciously kept, I don't know if that's the right word, that I'm looking for because it's been kept so accurately for thousands of years every single letter of the Torah we we know and we find identical between every copy so this is a modern practice that in fact is exactly as it was over 2000 years ago and maybe even longer